You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Hello, listeners. For tonight's episode, I suppose I would consider this a follow-up of a past series. Uh, anyone who's listened to the show for any length of time has likely come across the series of episodes I did about the 2012 disappearance of Emma Philippoff from Victoria, B.C. Well, Emma's case is going to be one of the cases featured in an upcoming book written by an author named L.J. Roberts. Uh, seeing as the book is coming out, and I don't believe there's ever been a book that included Emma before, I thought it would be good to invite the author to tell us a bit more about the book and to discuss Emma's case with me. So that's what we're going to hear tonight. So without any further ado, I'll get into the conversation with L.J. Roberts, and our topic is the disappearance of Emma Philippoff. Linz, I'm so excited to have you, both because we have a, a similar interest in the topic of Emma Philippoff's disappearance, but also because you are now the first guest of Nighttime who has joined in from all the way over in Sweden. How's life in Sweden and how are you doing over there? Life is good. It's nice and snowy, nice and cold. So I'm just sitting inside most of the time and researching unsolved cases and mysterious disappearances and blogging for Gen Y, just staying out of trouble. <laughs> wow. What a, what a like a, a, a gothic sounding life you have. It's like it's cold, it's snowy, and I'm inside the house researching unsolved murders and missing persons cases. Yeah. That that is a very di- that's a very dark way to spend your your time. But let let me ask you. You, you mentioned Gen Y Pod. I, I know you do blogging for them, and you and you write a lot on your own. But aside from that, tell me a bit about yourself. Who are you? Yeah, um, I'm Lens or Lindsay. I'm from the northeast of England. I spend a lot of time in Sweden. I used to travel a lot before this, and probably hopefully in the near future, I <laughs> used to have my own blog. Actually, that's where I started with the writing for fun. I just used to write about unsolved cases and aliens, <laughs> just mm-hmm. um, strange cases. I was really into them. And then I started blogging for Generation Y, doing true crime post weekly at genypod.com for them. And I recently wrote a book on unsolved disappearances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you How did you get started with Gen Y Pod? Because I know you, like you said there, you had your own blog where it was almost like um, every every post was like a different strange story sort of thing, or, or unsolved murder, or missing persons case. So you were doing it on your own, but how did you end up writing for them? Well, I used to have this really repetitive job, but they allowed us to listen to music. So after mm-hmm. there's only so many punk records you can listen to in a nine hour day so I switched over to podcasts and I started listening to true crime unsolved mysteries stuff like that and I got into generation mm-hmm. y and I just started consuming their back catalog basically and then I I think I messaged them one day and I was like oh I really like your podcast and I have this blog and I think they read uh the blog and then they said they asked me if I would consider writing for them I think it was just meant to be once a month but we ended doing like one per week and yeah every post on this wow. by me over three years now I've been doing that oh wow and the the reason you're here today is to talk about you about the the book you've wrote you've recently wrote and specifically the case of Emma's disappearance but tell me a bit about it what are you what are you doing with this book it's basically 10 cases of unsolved disappearances from 2000 to 2013 and they're, I would say, not from all over the world, but from uh, the US, Canada, and Europe, and Australia. So we have cases like, um, I think some that are quite known, like obviously Emma Philippoff, and we have some that aren't very popular or well-known, like the disappearance of Max Caster, who is a Swedish teenager who went on vacation to Australia and didn't return. And then I have um, Andrew Gosden. I think that's very popular in the UK. He's just a young high school kid who went missing after buying a train ticket to London. And then we have oh. um, 
you know, people who went missing in Nepal, people who have just dropped off the face of the earth for all in all different types of situations, really. Oh, fascinating. And were, were you are in your book and what I should ask as well, what's the book called before we get into it? It's called Have You Seen This Person? Right. And if people are interested in checking it out, we'll, we'll talk more about it at the end. But are, is it sold through like like Amazon, this sort of thing? Or where, where do people get the book? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you can. It's sold on Exposit Books, but under the tri, uh, True Crime catalog, sorry. But you can also just Google Have You Seen This Person by LJ Roberts. And it's available in a lot of places. And Amazon, like you mentioned, you can get it there too. Fantastic. Um, now, where you've collected stories of missing persons from basically all over the world, I'm really curious how someone in Sweden slash UK came to choose Emma's story. Like, what, what was it about Emma's story that stood out to you to the point that you wanted to include it in your book? I was actually thinking about this today. Like, I can't remember where I originally found Emma's case. I think it might have just been, you know, I, I search a lot of, I search for a lot of um, missing people stories or unsolved disappearances that have a lot of information to them. Like with Emma, I think she was quite young mm -hmm. and I kind of related to her in a way like she kept moving around. She had, if I can speak uh, candidly, she had some mental health issues mm -hmm. and she was just looking for somewhere to be or looking for something. And she did a lot of photography, a lot of writing. She was really creative. She met people quite easily. She, I think she was quite trusting, which I think I used to be too. And it's a lot of the missing people's cases I get interested in. It's I, I relate to it in a way. It's like, oh, that could have been me. That could have mm -hmm. been somebody I knew. Could have, you know, that could have been any of us at some point. Yeah. But with Emma's case, I think there was just so much information available. Like her mom did a great job of finding out information that, we would otherwise not know, like just from police and, you know, a few witness statements. Like she really went deep and detailed with the timeline on the Help Find Emma website. Mm -hmm. I think that was so useful. It's so um, comprehensive and clear. Mm -hmm. And then also um, when I heard your series on Emma, it was just, I don't think I've ever heard that many friends, family, witnesses be interviewed in such depth before. And I think the more you look at the case, the more you actually see. It might not be like pivotal information, but it becomes so addictive to just try and find clues in all of Emma's cryptid messages and letters and emails to people that like started to come out over the years that people were looking for her. I just think it's the more you look at it, the more you kind of see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see a lot of people, like just as you said there, a lot of people who get drawn into Emma's case do so due to like the ability to relate to her and see her as either in yourself or in your group of friends. Because for me, I had the same kind of experience. When when I first learned of Emma, I, was watch, I watched The Fifth Estate, the CBC documentary, and I had never heard of her case, and I just watched The Fifth Estate pretty much every episode. And as I'm watching Emma's story, it's just... I see Emma in so many of my friends from for a while I was like a musician so a lot of my my friends were kind of artistic and you know on kind of the fringes of society and I just saw Emma in so many of them and then when I see Emma's mom Shelly in the program as well I'm just like oh my god like that reminds me a lot of my mom and I just I saw so many connections where I was just so drawn in and as you mentioned like I've done a lot of interviews with friends and people close to Emma and her disappearance and it was really like I never planned to do that but every time I connected with one it was just I, I felt the connection to them that I felt with Emma so it was like it was almost like investigating the disappearance or I wouldn't say investigating it was almost like learning about the disappearance of a friend I never had through a bunch of other friends that I had never become friends with. Like it was just, it was strange the the experience there. And and like you said as well, there there is a lot of information out there about Emma's story. And it's all so strange that it really is like trying to navigate this really complicated and complex mystery. It's um 
it truly is a, a fascinating story. As you you wrote the your piece on Emma in your book, what sources did you go to? Like you mentioned a lot of podcasts and Fifth Estate, but where did you really learn her story from as you put it together? I think like um, it was the timeline first. Mm -hmm. And then I think your podcast was the best coverage that I actually found. And also um, your friend, you said you had a friend who wrote the Vice article. Yeah. That was great. Yeah, that. But I think your podcast really, really drew me in because like you interviewed Julian. Mm. And I don't think on the the CBC documentary that he really got a lot of time to speak there. Mm. But when you talk to him, like on the... On the documentary, it seemed as though he was just this creepy guy who like followed her around and wouldn't leave her alone. But when you interviewed him and he had more time to talk and and you just you just listened mm. and just you just let him go. And he he really described Emma. I think one of her friends said that when she listened to Julian's um, chat with you, that she felt he described her better than anybody. Yeah. And it kind of made me feel like, oh, he's not so, you know, suspicious and cold as he seems like he did have a connection with her he did care about her he really liked her but I think they just had some some complications with the friendship or something and I think he just came unfortunately when he used the word stalking in his email to her dad it just mm. was kind of the nail in the coffin for Julian I think. yeah I, I agree with you 100% and it's he he's almost like um in a way he's his own worst enemy because he's really uh, he's willing to talk about Emma but at the same time he's um he's so open with it and and a little awkward too and when you talk to someone that's a yeah. little awkward yeah. it just it gets I don't know you can read them the wrong way so I only knew about Julian originally from his portrayal on the CBC documentary which they had him portrayed as a as the villain basically in the cbc documentary yes but when um exactly. yeah but in in talking to him yeah I, I just like you described i the more i heard from him and kind of got to know the way he communicated the more it he went from like this suspicious dark character into this kind of just like heart sick guy is the way i would put it he seemed to really have yeah I yeah he had a different a attraction to emma it seemed than maybe she had to him and he didn't seem to handle that well socially i guess is how i would put that exactly i think he just um he could have gave up earlier on the friendship but then when when he was talking to you he would he mentioned that they would fall out and make friends and fall out and make friends so part of me kind of thought maybe he thought it was just another one of those fallouts that would resolve themselves you know mm -hmm. like maybe he thought oh there's a chance that you know she's just having a an off like time and maybe she'll come around again like last time like I remember he talked about the, um the last time he hung out with her was when he sort of insulted her or offended her when he asked about the why she always wore the camouflage trousers mm -hmm. and she didn't take it well and then they she was like, okay, I don't want you to walk with me anymore. Like, I don't want to know you anymore. And I think that was, if I'm correct, I think that was the last time they saw each other until he moved to Victoria. Right? I, I believe so. Yeah, I think they may have talked on the phone like once or something after a couple times, maybe after that. But yeah, that was really the, the last. And I, I, what do you make of the whole thing with Julian of him moving to Victoria? I know you're not from Canada, but where he was living and, and she was living, where they met in Ontario, Victoria is like, it's not like the city next door or anything. It would be a pretty big coincidence for him to move there. And he told me and told everyone else who asked that it was pure coincidence that he showed up living in the same city she's living in or was living in. What do you, what do you make of that? Um, I think that he probably tried to play that off because it did look very suspicious. Mm -hmm. But I think he did mention somewhere that he thought that he, she may have mentioned it and talked about it like a few times and maybe it was like a subconscious decision that he made. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like he was probably inspired to go there because of what Emma said. But then after she disappeared, he probably thought, um, I should just pretend it was a coincidence, maybe, because it just sounds so 
yeah deliberate but it was quite a while afterwards wasn't it wasn't it like a year yeah several months after? yeah i think yeah. it was close to a year like 10 months or something after she moved from their town in ontario perth it, to victoria that he showed up there but it's just it really like that's one thing about his story i could never get past is him showing up in in the same city she was in and kind of being in the same part of the city and like he describes when he talked to me of walking past stores and thinking like huh that looks like the kind of place that emma would shop and it just i don't i don't know that's i just can't i always try when i talk to someone like this i always try to put myself in their position and see how and try to imagine what it would feel like to be doing that to just to better understand it and some of the things that he said i just could i couldn't do that but um but at the end of the day I, i don't see there being i don't see him being involved in her disappearance I just see him being a major red herring that took a lot of suspicion and an attention um, throughout the course of people looking for him is the way I see it. I don't I, I don't see any situation yeah. where he's involved simply because he he doesn't seem like in talking to him. I, I don't know if you would call it like spider sense or something, but when I was talking to him, I didn't feel that he was being manipulative or really trying to hide anything. I, I, I didn't. Yeah. That's the thing. Mm. He's so open Yeah, and to, to almost a sort of, I would be embarrassed to be that open, I think, it, but he just goes for it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was my sense. And then also, if you just think of, they were, if they're downtown Victoria, where she was last seen and he did something and, like how would he get away with it he didn't have a car he drove around on a bike he's not the a big enough guy that he could like you know pick her up and take her away somewhere i just don't i don't see a situation where he's responsible When you were going through this story and, you know, listening to the podcasts and collecting the different pieces of writing, what were the things that you really focused in on? Like, there's there's so many little parts of her story that are strange and seem like they could really be a big deal with her disappearance, be it Julian or the, you know, the prepaid credit card, you know, just different things that kind of came up in Emma's story. Were there any kind of parts of her story that you really looked at and said, and you thought like, you know, that has to be important? Well, for me, I think it was the last two weeks before she went missing. I think there's a really, really big mental health element at play Mm -hmm. because when she was at the Sandy Merriman house, Mm -hmm. she, they said that the last two weeks before she went missing, they saw a change in her that was so that it was almost scary Mm -hmm. not in the way that she was violent or anything but that it just wasn't the same person anymore and one thing that really stuck out to me was the story that the staff told her Emma's mom when she said that one day she saw Emma moving all of the furniture to the street outside Mm -hmm. and when they asked why she said oh they're too noisy they talk too much and I was like oh wow that's that sounds like a, a psychotic break and the lev- like the CCTV, for example, like where she's going in and out of the YMCA like six times, looking out the window of the Seven Eleven too, as if someone's out there. And her journal entries where she said, I feel like I'm being followed. I feel like this car's been following me. I feel weird. Like she, and the phone calls to her mom too, like she wanted to go back home. Mm-hmm. Then she didn't. She wanted to go back, then she didn't. It's just this big, chaotic confusion that she was going through and like um, the night she went missing walking around without her shoes on and acting so bizarrely to the point that um, I think his name was, is it Daniel Quay? Uh, Den- Denny Quay, Quay or Dennis Quay, yeah. Dennis yeah. Quay, that's right, yeah. Um, y- yeah, the, uh, I... I she, he thought, uh, she actually asked her, is somebody following me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And th- that's kind of the same thought I had on it. There's There's some kind of question about 
some some people believe yes Emma was going through a mental break and you know maybe he, she had schizophrenia in her family so maybe that was coming on because she was around the right age for that to start coming if it was going to exactly. affect her some people see that as being in a, what was happening in her life but there is a whole nother kind of way of thinking or where people believe she actually was being followed and stalked and either by julian or someone else and she was just you know panicking trying to get a trying to get away from it but th- there are people who firmly believe that for better or worse but really there's the way i see it there's there's four explanations four possible outcomes of emma's case and i've talked a lot about this a lot on my episode but really the possibilities that i see are either she was the victim of foul play she intentionally met her end she accidentally met her end or she's still out there you know running away and you know living life off the grid um, it, it, those are kind of the four the four possibilities that seem to be most discussed. Do you have any reason to lean towards one or the other? Like, is there any part of her story that pushes you in a specific direction? Well, I think the mental health part of it is sort of like the precursor to whatever happened. Like, I think she was in a vulnerable state, which would leave her open to maybe um someone opportunistically you know doing something bad to her mm. but and also it could lead to her like um Shelley said that she thinks Emma might be homeless and might not remember who she is or she might be on the streets and she went around and fly at everybody and asked for information and I think that's a possibility but like you said earlier about maybe there was somebody following her, I, I remember, didn't she have an issue with somebody when she was doing her culinary course? There was somebody who was a, a man who was, or a, I don't know if it was a fellow student or whatever, but someone who wouldn't leave her alone. Yeah, and, and I believe when, when I talk to her friends, I don't know if you can if you can really get a sense of this in the episodes, there was stuff that happened to her while living in Victoria over that, you know, say the last year or so of her life that a lot of her friends didn't want to get into that seemed to involve ex an ex-boyfriend and just different people that she was connected to and sit in experiences she had with them. They, so there, there is more to her time in Victoria definitely than what came out in CBC or in my episodes, but there, there definitely was some sort of problem she had with, people besides julian aside from from julian but it's it's hard to say because it's when what's left behind to tell emma's story in a lot of ways is these different reports from her friends as well as her journals but her journals it's almost like from what i read of them anyway it's almost like trying to read like tea leaves you know like it's so poetic and whimsical that it doesn't really give a straight message Actually, when I was um, reviewing the CBC documentary just before we had this call, they they do like they flash some photography and some writing and stuff on the screen mm-hmm. at the in the first couple of minutes, and I just pressed pause and it I accidentally stopped on one part and it said something like, "What pants am I supposed to wear? What shoes upon my feet? I just want to be me." And I was like, "Oh, that that kind of." I wonder if that's about the Julian and the camouflage pants hmm. thing. And then there was another part and it was like. The key is water to sight, to light, the wonders of life. The key is water. And I was like, oh, that reminds me of when you did the interview with Connor and he said that you would just sit and stare at the water. It's like every time you see a little piece of her writing or something, it, although it's very cryptic, you can, like you said, you can kind of attribute it to something that you hear in the interviews. And it's like, it is like reading tea leaves. You're like, well, that clearly had a meaning, even though it looks like, you know, just a poem or just something that's not based in reality. But I think everything she did write down really did mean something if you could look at it in the right way. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me think that, I don't know, because I remember in that documentary too, they talked about maybe she she planned this, Mm -hmm. which I think is a bit 
far-fetched you know like she wanted to disappear yeah i but, i think it, there was just too much chaos going on for her for it to be in yeah. my mind for it to be this strategic plan thing for one if she was trying to get away and make a planned escape why would she bother luring her mother to victoria to possibly intercept her like that that alone those those calls and all the strange stuff she did leading up to it, it tells me that this wasn't this well thought out plan that in my mind yeah, anyway I, yeah i agree i agree with that i think it's a bit far-fetched but yeah like you mentioned the the prepaid credit card and the the phone mm -hmm. the burner phone that she bought and she'd never had a phone before so it it kind of illustrates fear in my opinion like she was she thought oh i'm gonna have to need to contact somebody at some point i need this there's like a sense of paranoia fear and whether it's real or imagined it's quite hard to work out i didn't know that there was um that when you interviewed her friends that there was things that you left out of the episode uh, that's very interesting yeah, well there was what ended up like all the interviews you hear you are let's say well julian's especially that's probably an hour-long interview taken from maybe yeah. four and a half hours of conversation so what I what I found is for one I had to edit it to length, but also what was happening in these conversations a lot, especially like in it happens with any interview, but especially so when I was talking to Emma's friends is we would quickly go back and forth between like on the record and off the record and these kind of like a lot of sidebar conversations and some stuff that was really personal just didn't about Emma just didn't seem appropriate to include in the in the episodes but some of it got shared so it was um it's kind of hard to explain but I think what I tried to do and what her friends tried to do is rather than my series being like an investigation into Emma's disappearance I more so wanted to do almost like a char a character profile of who Emma is and who Emma was at the time leading up to her disappearance. So I tried to focus more on her personality and, and you know, and the, the things that had happened that would show someone what kind of person she was and why they should care about her case, I think is the way I justified a lot of it. I hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and also, you don't want to overstep and, you know, mm -hmm. share too much about someone who was very private. And some things they probably don't add much to the story but it's interesting that there's so much that you didn't include do you think that influenced your idea of what might happen like the the things that you know that none of none of the others know like other people know who are researching a case too no nah, i i don't think so i think it's with any like missing persons case where the family is serving as their own advocates and trying to spread the story there is a bit of like choosing what information you share um, and, and how it's shared. It's almost like the way I see it, it's almost like there's this like sort of PR thing that's at play at the same time of sharing a story. And that's not unique to Emma or any missing person whose family is, is looking for them and advocating on their behalf. But also it's like, I think in my case with these episodes, I was really closely working in collaboration with Emma's mom and Emma's friends. So there was, it wasn't like I was showing up um, at someone's house with a stick and a microphone in their face and, and grilling them. This was very, these interviews were very like collaborative in helping them tell the story that they want to tell, if, if, if you know what I mean. But it's, uh, yeah. there, there was, there was nothing that was like removed that would be um, like big news or info. It was more, like um, personal things like related to health as, as an example that wouldn't be relevant to her story, but maybe it would be a story that, or maybe they would tell me something that involved, you know, this health, medical detail or something that I didn't want to include. Or there were some things which I found really interesting. And I, I think I may have mentioned this. One friend just in passing had described... I think it was Micah who was close with Emma or leading right up to her disappearance. I, I believe Micah had told me a story that I that I cut from the episode that was um, 
I think Emma had tried to give her a teddy bear, I believe, and wanted her... I think Emma had thrown it away and then took it back and maybe she gave it to Micah. And it was just this kind of weird little story. And I initially had it in the episode. It was going to be in there. But then when I was talking to Emma's mom and I I had mentioned, you know, this story that Micah had told me about the teddy bear, uh, Emma's mom was got so emotional and asked that it not be included. And the reason for that is it turns out that this teddy bear was something that Emma had since she was like a little girl. And just the idea of that teddy bear becoming like a a public discussion point in this story was just too much for her mom to take. And that that would be an example of something that was left out. It's, it's completely irrelevant to the story, but it's something that just is a, is a very, emotional thing to have and personal thing to have out in public if that, does that make sense yeah I th- yeah i think i re- i think i heard or read about the the teddy bear somewhere i think it was one of the items that she kept in the backpack that she always wore yeah like apparently she just yeah she carried around things that weren't really they were non-essential items but they were like really meaningful mm-hmm. yeah so the idea that she would have you know tried to give it away and or like not have it attached to her anymore is, is quite an interesting point but i could see why you would you would leave it out mm, yeah it's just yeah absolutely no it's um with with emma's case we're, we're now at i guess it's been about nine years she disappeared in tw- november of 2012 so we're we're at nine years since she she was last seen like in a story like this where she hasn't turned up and no significant new information has turned up like, do you see this having any kind of end? What What is your personal thoughts on possible resolution to Emma's story? I feel like most missing people, they're found relatively quickly. And those who aren't, they, they don't seem to be found ever or for a very long time. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know why. I just feel like we will see some kind of development in Emma's case. and I, And I think she might... She could just be living a, a different life, you know, like like her mom said, she might not actually know who she is. Like if she has, um, if it is mental health related and she has untreated, you know, conditions or spells, then maybe she's just living somewhere else. Not quite sure who she is, what she's doing, but she's just going with that lifestyle. It doesn't seem like... It doesn't seem like she thought she wanted to leave voluntarily, but maybe she's just ended up somewhere and she's thought, yeah, okay, this is, this is like, because like she used to stay on people's boats, mm. she used to stay in people's houses, just new friends, new acquaintances. I, I have a feeling that she might have found a group or a person or somebody that she could just stay with and then decided, yeah, this is, this is what I'll do. Mm. But another side of me kind of thinks that, I'm not really sure. It's it's just I suppose that's why it, it, it made it to the Unsolved Disappearances book. It became a chapter because it's just one of those cases where there's so much information it shouldn't have it shouldn't have really happened. Like there were so many people who noticed there was something up with her, they wanted to help her, but she kind of slipped through the net and it it just seems it's gone on for so long. Like there was the, the Holly Clark case. It was very, very similar and it was resolved like quite quickly it had an unfortunate ending but it it did get resolved a lot more quickly than Emma's case and it's just kind of strange that something could go on for so long without without there being anything there like a sighting or Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. I I feel the same and it's the the one thing I always look to is you you mentioned Holly Clark her her story is so similar to Emma's um both women both young women went missing very near water like emma was right on the waterfront like on the harbor in victoria and holly was walking towards water when she was last seen um holly turned up in water um she was deceased of course but i i think in emma's case i always look to that as a way that she could have um, either met her end and not been found or got completely out of the area, like hopped on a boat and, you know, 
somehow manage to get away from the area and just disappear. I just think when I think of Emma getting away, be it on her own or with other people and surviving, I can't help but look back at everything she did leading up to her disappearance, telling us that it was chaos and madness and not strategic. I just can't see her being able to escape and get away. But who's to say that she's not, you know, living homeless in, you know, some some other country or in Costa Rica or something like it, I guess it, it is possible. But you would think that if the decline we see in her last months in Victoria had continued, she would end up, you know, uh, being uh, f- making herself known somewhere wherever she ended up. I, I just can't help but think that. Yeah, and the, the story came out much like a few years after she went missing, I think, where a guy admitted that he had picked her up when he saw her in the rain mm-hmm. and gave her a ride. And I think she, if you keep accepting rides and you keep getting into cars, and you, you can get pretty far away. Like, she, she could be very far away from Victoria. That's why she hasn't been located. Like, maybe the, the news didn't spread that far. The pamphlets didn't get that far. The, you know, maybe... People just aren't aware of the case. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think she could have uh, covered a lot of ground just by accepting rights from strangers and then getting out. And she seemed to be like, it's as if she was running from something, afraid of something, wanted to get really far away from it, but we don't know what the it is. Mm. It's, yeah. Or if the it is even a, a real tangible thing. So it's... Yeah, it, exactly. it is just um, through and through a pure mystery. What do you make of the, the green shirt guy? That was the guy who was seen tearing down the flyers and be, uh, in Vancouver, yeah. a neighboring city, being like, you know, she's not missing. It's my girlfriend. What, what do you make of this character? This, Yeah, this, um, this alarmed me in a way because obviously he could just, you know, he could be nobody. He could be not like unconnected to the case, but... People kind of look at Julian a lot, but I feel like the green shirt guy is a way more sinister character in a way. Maybe not sinister, but I feel like they couldn't track him down. I'm sure they, they've tried, but I feel like he, if anybody, like maybe this guy, it would be great to identify him and talk to him, like interview him about it. You know, the, maybe the if the police could talk to that guy about it, I think he... He's the only one that's likely to have, like, he was angry. He, he came in with the flyer all scrambled. He was really agitated, like, when he was looking around the shop. He went in and looked at things before he um, was angry to the staff about it, which is kind of strange. Like, yeah. his behavior was really weird to me. And if he does have anything to do with Emma, that's, especially the state that she was in, like, you'd think that she would have needed some kind of help mm-hmm. somewhere to, to get, like, you know, back to a, a regular state of mind. But mm. if he, if she has ended up with with somebody, you know, like she was very nice, like her dad said, um, he worried that she got taken advantage of all the time. So when she was in such a confused state, if she did run across somebody and they're like, oh, you can stay with me. And then they, like, people didn't want to let Emma go. So if she's in a vulnerable state and she met somebody like that and they, they just try to keep her around, that kind of worries me. It's a possibility. Absolutely, yeah. With with him, with the green yeah. shirt guy, even if he doesn't have information, it would just be... He, he's so um, significant when someone looks at Emma's story that it would just be nice to find him and either realize he's just a nut who has no connection to Emma and remove him from the equation. Exactly. Uh, but it's... Um, Emma's story is just... There's this mystery with all these little mysteries and odd items kind of sprinkled over it and it makes it really hard to try to figure out what may have happened because of that but I guess that's what gives people so much to consider and talk about and as a result of that it helps spread Emma's story further so it gets more people you know aware of her face and you know may if she's out there it could help you know identify her at some point but I um I, I just hope to see a resolution at some point because it's, you know, nine years is a long time to be wondering if your child is alive or dead. Or like Shelly said, she says uh, there's there's nights that I just lay in bed thinking that Emma's like locked in someone's basement somewhere like that. To, yeah. to live with that 
certainly that has to be harder than to just grieve the loss of a child like this when you're the parent or a loved one of a missing person that kind of vague sense of loss that you're you're stuck in i just i can't even like as someone who's never experienced that i can't put my head in a position to even guess what that must feel like yeah just like being broken hearted and worried forever like there's one um one dad in the book like in chapter two i think it is mm -hmm. chapter three sorry it's andrew gustin mm -hmm. his his dad his story you can feel the heartbreak when he talks to you like it affected his life in such like obviously in such a terrible way but to the point where he he used to preach in church he can't do that anymore he can't work anymore he's completely depressed he he attempted suicide the police pointed um the finger at him oh. they they accused him of you know maybe you abused your own son maybe that's why he ran away and he's just so broken but he hasn't given up looking for andrew he still writes blogs trying to reach out to him talk to him find him and it's just i think that's one of the things like when you're looking at a case and it's unsolved you're like some people are like excited to you know try and piece it together figure it out but when you actually get into it and you talk to people who knew the missing person or missing family member it's actually just really heartbreaking and it seems as if i'm not sure who they other than charities i'm not sure who they're supposed to turn to hmm. like it just becomes like they have to search by themselves and it's a full-time job like they don't it's it's more than a full-time job when when they finish flyering and you know looking posting online trying to find information they still have to go home and and deal with that pain and it's it's just a it makes you i think that's what makes you want to help solve it and spread the story and get more people interested mm -hmm. it's just a another side to these mysteries that people like to listen to or read about but there's a really heartbreaking core to it all mm -hmm. like more than you can explain yeah it's very hard to explain it's just yeah heartbreak forever mm -hmm. Well, well, we'll end with that. But be, before we go, for people who want to read your book, read more of your blog posts, where, where do people find you? Yeah, you can read the blog posts at genypods.com. Uh, there's weekly, I post every Tuesday, so there's weekly recent true crime articles there and like updates on old cold cases. And the book you can get from expositbooks.com or you can just search it and you'll probably find it at a store in your area. Also, where you can order it online. Are you ready to announce the podcast yet, or is this still a work in progress? It's a work in progress, but it is called Dystopian Simulation Podcast. So I think there's an Instagram profile you can follow, and when we put out an episode, um, it'll get updated there. If anyone is interested in learning a bit more about Lynn's or purchasing a copy of her book, I've added all the links you'll need in the episode description. And with that said, I'm going to start wrapping up this episode of Nighttime. But before we part, I'm going to give thanks. First, a huge thanks to Lynn's for joining me in this discussion about Emma Filipoff. As well, a big shout out to Monty Data for contributing the music to the episode. It's a piece called Noir Tokyo. And lastly, a massive thank you to everyone who listens to Nighttime. Without your interest and your support, Nighttime would be as pointless as it would be impossible. But with that said, keeping the show alive has and has always been an uphill battle. So if you want to help take a bit of the weight off the show's back, please consider subscribing to the premium feed. Not only does it make the show possible, It'll also give you more of each topic than you're going to find here on the free feed as I'm adding exclusive content to it almost weekly. For about the price of a cup of coffee, you'll help keep the show alive and get a bit more of nighttime by subscribing to the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with the topic on the premium feed, let me thank the newest subscribers. Sierra, Sean G, Danny, Laura, Andrea, Jade, Denny, Lisa, Katari, and Courtney. 
thank you all for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to help support the show but can't do it financially, you can give me a huge hand by simply sharing the episodes on social media. And if anyone out there has any story ideas or would like to give feedback on the show, contact me at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. You can also find me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and I'm live on YouTube most Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday nights at 9 Eastern Time. And until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.